in. How many of you saw uh, President Barack Obama's State of the Union speech back in January? Okay, most of you. How many of you remember that in that speech he said that this country was facing a Sputnik moment? You remember that statement? Maybe not too many of you seem to remember that statement. Maybe that's because, do you know what the Sputnik moment was? What, what now? What was the Sputnik moment? Yeah. You know when that was? 1957. If you didn't think I was old already, in 1957 I was a freshman in high school. So I got to the, the, the Sputnik moment. What a Sputnik moment is, moment is, is a wake-up call. And the Sputnik, and, and that wake-up call was that this country had fallen behind the Soviet Union technologically, and they put, they put that, ex exactly what the young man said, they put the first satellite into orbit. All it did was beep, sent a little radio beep. It didn't measure anything. It wasn't re really, but, but they got it up there. The first thing it did was create a sense of urgency. Uh, you know, we're competitive as a people and we couldn't stand being behind. So it created a sense of urgency. The nation was at risk because the ability to put satellites into orbit also carried with it the ability to carry thermonuclear weapons anywhere on the planet that they wanted to go. So it created this great sense of urgency. And the response was wrapped up, it's not the totality of it, but the biggest part of the response was wrapped up in something called the National Defense Education Act. And uh, then in the rest of my time in high school, I saw these great additions to the science labs uh, around. You had, it's when the National Defense Education loans that were forgivable uh, it came into being there now. Uh, th those things are still alive uh, as in the, in the Perkins loan program. So you had this great massive response uh, because of this sense of urgency. Now, President Obama mentioned the, uh, the Sputnik moment that we face today, but I don't think he particularly explained it real well. Do any of you know what he was talking about? What now? No, not going to Mars. Something a whole lot more mundane than that, but important. This is the first time in American history that the, that the generation of 25 to 34 year olds are less educated than their parents were. Now think about that for a minute. So the first time in American history that 25 to 34 year olds have less education than their parents did. That has led to a situation where for the first time in a, in a long time, this country no longer leads the world in terms of the percentage of college graduates in its population. 15 years ago, we were number one. Today, we're 12th. Guess what country has the highest percentage of college graduates in its population? No. South Korea. Canada's two. The, the rest of the list has countries in it that would surprise you. So just like Sputnik, you know, this isn't necessarily as dramatic as a, as, as a satellite going in orbit, you know, right then, that, that, that pinpoint moment. What's happened here has happened over time. Uh, and it's happened, uh, I think, uh, because Americans have not, A, valued education enough and been willing to pay the price to get that educational attainment up to where it needs to be. Now let's bring that home. Um, to, to southeast and south central Kentucky. What's true for the nation is even more dramatically true for our region. 
uh, our region runs about 10% below the national averages in terms of educational attainment. Now we're getting better. Uh, in, in, in Southeast and South Central Kentucky, the going rate of, of high school graduates going to college is now at a, a little over 60%, which is very, very close to the national uh, average. Uh, it hasn't been, it, it's been pretty good for a long time, but the, the, the pr part of the problem is, is what happens to those folks after they graduate from college. Too many of those young people from Eastern Kentucky that have come ahead of you have gone off to school, graduated, and not come back. Uh, anybody here from Owsley County? There was, a, there was a very fine letter to the editor, I don't remember who wrote it, from a gentleman in Owsley County uh, in the Lexington Herald Leader maybe three months ago. And his point was this, he says, I'm tired of reading about low educational attainment in Owsley County. He says, if all the young people that have left Owsley County and gone to Eastern and UK and Moorhead had come back, we'd have a much higher educational attainment level than, than we have today. So part of my message to, to you today is, and I, is you all are on the right track educationally. But before I, before I get there, you know, that 60% going rate, only 26% of the high school graduates coming out of our region are prepared to do college level work, which means that 70, the, the, the other 74% apply that 26 to the 60 that are going and you can extrapolate that 74% of the, of the young people that are going to college are having to do remedial work when they get there and that's not a good thing. The state average on that by the way is about 60 is, a, is about 60%. But you guys, but, but, but you guys value education. And as I said a few, a few moments ago, you are on the right track to the level of educational attainment that's going to help you and it's going to help this region, particularly if you stay there. This center and the work that Congressman Rogers has done throughout the 5th Congressional District has been aimed, a significant part of it, is aimed at entrepreneurship and small business development because folks that's the that's the major way that we're going to provide opportunities throughout the 5th Congressional District for educated people to find the kind of employment that that justifies the investment that they've made in their in, in their education. The other thing that you're doing is you're preparing yourselves for leadership and that's what I like you know the small commercial here for Eastern Kentucky University, we concentrate on three things. We concentrate on student success, regional stewardship, that's one of the reasons I'm here t today, and in making our students informed, critical, and creative thinkers who can communicate. And those, those three skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, the ability to, to communicate, are essential for leadership. And that's why I like to think that one of the major things that we do at Eastern is prepare people for, ro for, leader for leadership roles. Now I'm going to give you, I think I may have done this down here last year too, Lonnie, I don't, rec I don't recall, but I'm going to give you the Doug Whitlock five point short course in leadership. Have you heard this one? You've heard that one, haven't you? You think that'd be alright for this group? Okay. Soles of your shoes. Everybody in a leader posi leadership position at any level. I don't care whether it's, I don't care whether it's your class president, uh, local government official, university president, U.S. congressman, president of the United States. Everybody that's in a leadership position, at some time or other, is going to be tempted to do. one of two things. Either do the right thing the wrong way 
or to do something that's patently wrong. And the temptation to do the right thing the wrong way is sometimes sort of, uh, sort of seductive. Uh, that's that old trap that the, that the ends justifies the means. But the thing that you've got to keep in mind is that process is important. So not only is it important to do the right thing, it's important to do the right thing the wrong way, the right way. So you might be tempted to do the right thing the wrong way, or you might just be tempted to do something that's just patently wrong, unethical, illegal, you name it. When that happens, take the high road. Take the road so high that the only thing your tempters see are the soles of your shoes. So that's soles of your shoes. No mirrors. And I'll use the word seduct seductive a few times here, I guess. But leadership, leadership is also seductive. You know, we've all heard the, 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 the statement that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, some people relish being in leadership roles because they think it, it glorifies them. Simple fact of the matter is, is that leadership's not about the leader. Leadership is about the people in the organization, but more fundamentally, leadership is about the mission and purpose of, of the organization, whether that's a business, whether that's a local government, whether that's a university, any organization that you can name. The mission, which is usually focused on what the, service, the goods and services are, uh, that, that the organization is supposed to be doing, that's what's important. You've all heard the, the, the thing that it's amazing what you can get done when you don't care who gets the credit. So that's part of this too. Ego is not part of leadership. So no mirrors. You don't need anything to reflect your glory back on yourself because it's not about you. Be lazy. This is not completely foreign to the first one. Every leader at some time or other is, attempt, is tempted to sugarcoat something. To tell a little white lie because the truth might be painful to somebody. The problem with lies are is they can't live alone. They, don't, they can't live in a, in, in a vacuum. Because when you deviate from the truth and you tell a falsehood, even if it was a little white lie designed to be, to, to, to be kinder than what the truth might be, you wind up having to tell another lie to cover that lie, and then another one to cover that one. Uh, you know, that's the best case scenario if it's, if, it's, uh, if, it's, if, if, if it's a little white lie, but sometimes it's even worse than that. And somewhere along the line, you all run into folks who are deceitful, who like to play one person off against another, and they'll tell person B something about person A, in person B, in, in person A, something about C or B. And they weave these great webs of deceit. Now, whether you're talking about a little white lie and all the other little white lies that have to support it, or whether you're talking about something truly deceitful, it gets to be a lot of work. I mean, you've got to remember what version of it you told this person and what version of it you told this person and what you said about this person to that person. So be lazy. Always tell the truth and then you don't have to remember what you said. So that's the first three. Right guard. You've all heard, or you've probably heard it sometime or other, that leadership is lonely. Uh, and there are certain things that the leader has to internalize 
and, 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 and ponder on ponder is a wonderful word. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and keep to himself or herself until the time is right. Or sometimes you have to hold, this is another thing about leadership, if somebody asks you to keep something in confidence and they haven't killed somebody <laughs> or committed some other kind of, uh, of, of felony, if, if, if they're sharing with you something that's not illegal, if somebody asks you to keep something in confidence, take it to your deathbed. Uh, because otherwise, other, because trust, trust is something that once lost is extremely difficult to, uh, to regain. And leaders can, can, effective leaders do not suffer from knee-jerk reactions. You don't go off half-cocked. You don't believe by default the first version you hear of something. Get all of your information. And panic in a leader does not install, you know, knee-jerk reactions, panic, apparent uncertainty, even if you're not certain. You can't let it show. So right guard, don't ever let them see you sweat. That's, that's the fourth one. And then Kenny Rogers. One of my great mentors was the sixth president of Eastern Kentucky University, a uh, fellow from Lincoln County originally, big man, about 6'5", 350, Robert R. Martin, uh, the most politically astute person I have ever known. And uh, Dr. Martin had these four, four rules of, uh, of politics. And um, the first couple of them are pretty Machiavellian. Now, I, I remember asking in this room last year, who, who was Machiavelli? Yeah, wrote The Prince. And what's the, what's the prince about? When, when you say something's Machiavellian, it usually means, well, it doesn't usually mean, it means that you're describing the qualities of the prince that Machiavelli wrote about. And he was kind of a political philosopher, I guess you would say. But the prince, but Machiavelli's prince was a conniving, devious manipulator. So when you say something's Machiavellian, that's usually what you mean and it's, and it's, and it's typically not very complimentary. But Dr. Martin's first rule of politics, and most of you have heard of this one, is never stab a king unless you kill him. Second one was never kill someone who's committing suicide. Both of those are pretty, pretty, pr pretty Machiavellian. The last two, and this is the one that really gets to Kenny Rogers, the last two, and almost everybody's heard uh, the first one, and that's don't waste your time fighting battles that are already lost. Now, Dr. Martin would say that. He'd say, don't waste your time fighting battles that are already lost. But occasionally the lost battle is over such a matter of important principle that you cannot be seen to acquiesce, that you've got to continue to fight battles of principle even after they're lost. And then there's the corollary to it. And you don't think about this one a lot. And that's don't continue to fight battles after they're already one. Folks, there are, there are bad winners just like there are bad losers. And bad winners continue to fight the battle after it's won and because they get some perverse pleasure out of rubbing somebody's nose in it. And that's not a good thing. The other really awful thing about continuing to fight battles after they're already won, you can turn a victory into a loss. Because I've seen people continue to push, I'm sure you have too, continue to push when the answer was yes and change a yes into a no. So don't waste your time fighting battles that are already lost, unless. Don't waste your time fighting battles that are already won. Kenny Rogers. 
you got to know when to hold them and you got to know when to fold them.